It was like one of the worst days of my life. Wow. Apparently, there was a fake bank note in the money the guy gave me. No way. And I took it to America Embassy. Y Yo. <laughs> when I was growing up, there was, there was no even a car coming to my village. You have to wait, I think, every Sunday to actually see a car. Oh, and did you have lights? No, nah, we, we never had lights. It got to a point that I, I would not be able to sleep for like five days. I was on wow. medication. I was on uh, Trazodone. So you have to take these medications before you could sleep. Yeah. Medicines aid. I actually went to school for that. I got my license mm -hmm. and then they, you know, we were supposed to work in, in a nursing home for like three days. Because every time I went and came back home, I, I felt my spirit was dumping. What are some of the challenges that you face as a, as a restaurant? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the journey. This is where we uncover the stories of people from all corners of the world. Today, our guest, personally, I call him Big Mo, but he's well known as Chef Mo. Chef Mo is an outstanding chef and restaurant owner in New York. <music> chef Mo, Bonjour. welcome to the journey. Thank you. Man, I, I know you were super busy, man. So it's, it's really an honor to have you on our show. We are excited to have you here, Thank honestly. You. When I was on my way, I was thinking about your name, Mo. Does it, does it stand for Moses or Mohammed or? Nah, my name is Moses. So what is your actual name? Okay, so the actual name is Moses Ni Okai Okai Moses. Moses Ni Okai Okai Moses. Yes. You have two Moses. Yes. The knee or kind makes you a half gun or something? No, I'm a gun. Oh, straight gun. Yes. Great. So w which part of Ghana did you grow, grow up? I mean, I, I'm gun, but I wasn't born in Accra. Yeah, I was born in the Brown Hafo region. Oh, yeah. and, and how was life in Brown Hafo region? I didn't spend much time there. I think, I think the first seven years of my life, Okay. pretty much. Okay. I think I lived there when I was about eight and a half. To Accra, yeah. So it's just early childhood memories, right. you know. But I didn't really spend much time there. The place I was born, it, it wasn't the capital of Sunyani, like, right? You know, it was an outskirts. Okay, this is a cocoa farm. Oh, so we literally live on the cocoa farm. So we were actually living on the plantation itself. Wow. Yes, that is where I was born. The part we were living was called Inkrankrum because it was actually gun settlers mm. that were living in that village mm. so chrome. Ga, chrome interesting which means you know the settlers of gas you saw that part is from that place i mean literally when i was growing up there was there, there was no even a car coming to my village yeah you have to wait i think every sunday to actually see a car wow and did you have lights no nah, we, we never had light okay <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, quite I, I was born in the deep. In, mm, I was what born in the deep. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's quite an interesting story right there. My early childhood education was in the village I was talking about. So I don't know if you've heard of Tano, the, yes. the river. So the river actually passes through my village. I think just a minute from, from the there. Tano River. So our break, our break time excitement was actually to go to the Tano to, and, and, play. Have, and look at the fish, you know. Wow. Let's move fa fast forward to your life uh, in America. When you got here, what was your expectations? Uh, literally, I mean, that has never been in my thoughts. It has never, nah, it has never occurred to me. You didn't even plan about coming to America? No, I, I, I mean, I got lucky. You got lucky? Yes. Wow. Because I, I was literally out of work. So I had a friend who was living in Madima. She had a store over there. So, you know, I'll go and help her out. So one day I was just sitting in front of the store and these two gentlemen came mm -hmm. and they said, oh, they're doing visa lottery. So, you know, literally you're not going to pay anything. They're just going to register you. Really? Yes. So they, they, told so you they registered me. And just that like was that. It. I never heard of them until after five years. One day I was there and my phone rang. Five years time, later, because literally what they do is they actually register a bunch of people right. and they put it in the system. So every time, like if you don't win every year, they have a bunch of people mm. and then they keep putting it. 
it was five years later. I mean, literally when they called me, they had made a mistake and changed my surname. Really? Yeah, but so you still, mm -hmm. when they called me, I was like, uh, my name is Moses, Moses, but the same name, I don't know about it. Right. You know what I mean? So Story what happened? Did they change it or you just, you kept it? Yeah. So, you know, the guy was like, okay, I mean, I'm not too sure, but you know, we have a photo on the application. And so that was your photo? That was my photo. Okay. So if you want to come and look at it, fine, you could come and look at it. Right. The guy actually drove to my house and then he brought the application and it was me. But the, the last name had changed. Had changed. Oh. I mean, we had to do some changes, you right. know, to advert the names and right. all that. But that was five years later. I had even forgotten, forgotten about it. It wasn't about even it. in my thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Getting the visa to actually come here was kind of crazy. Mm. Because I remember the first day I had to go for the interview. I didn't have the application fee. I did not have the application fee. I literally had to take, you know, the lottery ticket and everything mm -hmm. and go to this you know godfather of mine right and i was like yo if you don't help me out today I'm my dead. life is over <laughs> <laughs> and quite interesting he said listen i don't have money with me this guy owes me money here's okay. his number if you call him and he gives you the money you can take Hallelujah. it Hallelujah. i was supposed to be at american embassy by 9 a.m by the time I, I called this guy and for some reason he said you know what meet me at Medina Junction. I went there, he said, listen, I don't have all the money, but mm -hmm. this is what I have. Mm -hmm. So I took the money and right. I don't know, for some reason I'm like, you, you know what, I'm gonna go and let them know that, you know, I couldn't come with, up with the money. When I got to American Embassy, it was around 12 noon. But you, know, you were supposed to be there by nine. 9 a.m. <laughs> I was chasing late. the money for the application, so. <laughs> I went there at 12 noon, and then this security guy was there. I explained my issue to him, and he was like, okay, go in. Mm -hmm. And one of the worst moments in my life happened at really? the American Embassy. So I told them I didn't have all the money, so right. what I had. And they said, okay, you could actually pay for it. Mm -hmm. Because I think it takes about three months for them to approve it. Mm -hmm. So... They were like, okay, you can actually pay for it, like half of it, and then your subsequent interviews, when you come, you can pay actually the pay the rest. So I gave the money to the guy. Mm -hmm. And then the guy kept counting, counting the, money. the money. At a point in time, he stopped mm. and went to the back room. And he was there for like 20 minutes. So, you know, I was kind of... Like, what's, what's actually going on? Well, what is going on? I mean, I just gave you money. My, if you my don't money? Want... Yeah, so give my money back to me. Let <laughs> exactly. me go. Exactly. And then this guy came back. And he just kneeled on the window. Mm -hmm. And he said, Abrantye, Opa Sempa. Opa Sempa. Yes. What did you do? So, apparently... There was a fake bank note in the money the guy gave me. No way. Trust me. And I took it to American Embassy. E e <laughs> 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 no, bro, I'm telling you, we're laughing about this situation right now, but back then when it happened, right. it, wasn't, it wasn't funny. You when the to guy America? told me, my heart literally sank within me. And then he went back inside. Mm -hmm. he, he was there for like another 30 minutes before he came back. And he asked me, do you have another money to replace this yes. note? That was the last money in my pocket. It wasn't even enough. It wasn't even enough. And then it, there was a fake currency in it. It was, it was like one of the worst days of my life. Wow. So I actually gave him the note. He gave it to me back. And he told me I'm a lucky guy. Oh, bro. Wow. There, there, there's a whole lot of story. I think at a point in time, one of the interviews that I went, a friend of mine gave me his address. Mm -hmm. And he, he forgot the, um, the zip code. The zip that was code. my last interview for them to actually, you know, give, you the visa? give me the visa. And the guy forgot to give me the zip, zip code. code. And it was like 9 a.m. in the morning. So literally, it was midnight over here. So I was calling this guy. <laughs> He's asleep, bro. He's asleep. I had to go to busy internet, mm -hmm. you know, go take the address, cut it, and put it right there so it will fit. Bro, when I was coming back, and then I got down from the taxi, it started raining. You know what? <laughs>
Listen. Yo, it was raining so hard those few moments that I actually walked to the embassy. Right. I was soaked. And then there was this white lady. She was there. Mm -hmm. And she just looked at me in the window and she shook her head. And she just stamped it. Oh. And gave me a day to come for my visa. Man, I'm touched. <laughs> Yo, I'm, I'm really touched, man. Do you even remember your first job? Yes, so, you know, you come to America and everybody is telling you this, 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 this. Yeah, they said, oh, well, um, nursing's aid. Nursing's aid. So right. I actually went to school for that. Okay. And then when I completed, you know, I got my license mm -hmm. and then, they, you know, we were supposed to work in, in a nursing home for like three days. Mm. Bro, I went there for the first day, second day, and my soul wasn't in it. That, that, that wouldn't be a job that I would do. Right. You it's know. not like it's a bad thing. Nah, it's not it's bad. Not, but it's, it's not, it's not just bad. Not yeah, I just feel, nah, it wasn't it's, for me. That's right. Because every time I went and came back home, I, I felt my spirit was dampened. Hmm. Three days after I finished the, um, the training with them, right. and then I got a job at a nursing home as a dietary aide. Mm. Yes. So. But did you have training? No, I never had training. You know, you would do on the job dish, training. You know, okay. yeah, they train you on the on job. The job, okay. You do dishwashing. You yeah. help with, you know. So that is where my journey actually started. Started. Right. That first job mm. at the kitchen cooking has always been around me i'm saying that because i never thought i would use it as a profession okay but cooking has always been with me since ever since i was a kid why do you say that yeah because when i moved from the village and came to accra mm -hmm. i actually came to live with my uncle and my uncle ate only two things from outside okay watch it he has one specific place we buy it from dakuma that is the only place mm. we buy the wache he eats and kinky okay. we go all the way to jamestown the square right there's this particular woman there that is the only place he eats kinky from anything he eats mm -hmm. we have to prepare it in the house oh yes so, so that is how i learned to cook if you live with him you have to learn how you, to you have to because he only does, eats two things nah, from outside only two and watch those kinky. things he might even eat them like every three months and and those are the people that you would have to make almost everything fresh for them my elder sister mm -hmm. abigail she's actually the best cook in the family nice so, abigail shout out to you wherever <laughs> you are <laughs> yes so back there you know how we do the morning and evening um school the morning yes, and afternoon yes, school. Yes, yes. we had different shifts mm -hmm. so when she was in the morning i was in the afternoon when i right. was in the afternoon so some of the food she will do the soup and when i come home i have to come and do the fufu or, right, the right. or if she is in the afternoon mm -hmm. i have to do the soup or the stew and when she comes she will so, do the banku or the fufu yeah so we were always alternating that right so that is where i actually learned how to cook but back then it was a punishment for me you saw it as a punishment that as i was i was fuming because my uncle also had kids oh yeah he had kids you know what I mean? And they were not doing nah, that. No, they were not doing that. We were the one preparing the food for him. I feel you, man. Yeah. Your guys will come and look for you in the house. And, and when you're they in come, the you are in the kitchen driving Banku. Like, yo, come on. You know how it is in Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> they will That's... think you are a Kojube Sia or something. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up, I was, I, was, I, I was a bit... I was bitter. I was bitter. If I... I don't know why... I should be subjected to that. Okay. You know, I didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. But now maybe I'll understand that. Right. As much as I hate to admit, that also taught me certain things. That's right. To be independent. You know, there are days that I sit down and think that if I wasn't mad, could right. I have become a better chef than I am right Today. now? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. So I, want, I wanted to know, before you could work in one of those prominent restaurants you got to go to a culinary school and all that did you I, I went to a culinary school where uh westchester community college for how long um two and a half years two and a half years yeah it's a two and a half years course it's um food service okay and uh culinary arts you completed no nah, i did two years oh you were almost there yeah i what had happened? two jobs 
See, that's the thing. <laughs> to, you know, juggle school and job here is... Yeah, is, is, is bro, it, it was tough because I had 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. job. And then I have 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. job yeah. plus school. That's hard. So literally, I wasn't sleeping. I was literally a zombie. Yeah, because between those two shifts, you only have eight hours in between. Yeah. So if you're doing school for six hours. Six hours. You got two hours Two left. hours. Wow. I could count how many times I slept on the Metro North and ended up in Harlem. <laughs> I actually quit my job in 20, I think 2018. Yeah, because I was actually going through a tough time in my okay. life. A very dark moment. You know, I was telling you that I had two jobs. Right. And literally, I was sleeping like two hours, hours in yes. between those two jobs and going to school at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in the past, I had insomnia, but that also worsened it. And mm -hmm. it got to a point that I, I would not be able to sleep for like five days. And I was on wow. medication. Yeah, I was on uh, Trazodone. Mm. 150 milligrams. So you have to take these medications before you could sleep. Yeah. But, you know, these medications, it works to a certain point mm -hmm. and at a point in time, your body gets used to used it. Used to it, yes. Trazodone is a very strong medication. A 50 milligram is, is enough to put anybody to sleep. sleep. I was taking 150 milligrams. Wow. Yeah. It got to a point that, you know, I started drinking before I would sleep. Mm. Yeah, and it, it was bad. It was bad. It got to a point where, so with the alcohol and the medication, and the medication, I could take it and I was still not asleep. But when I fall asleep, I'm sleeping for days. I could literally sleep for two days straight. Yeah, hmm. two three days straight. It, it was starting to have affect my work because mm -hmm. you know, I as a chef, I was working six o'clock in the morning, and in the city. Nah, here in the Bronx. Okay, okay. I did work at uh, two nursing homes in the Bronx. Okay. And then I also work at uh, Mount Kisco Hospital, yeah, as a chef over there. How did you come out of it? Nah, it took a long time. It took a long time. It started affecting my health. Right. You know, at a point in time, it got, it got really, really serious. Did your family know about it? No, I mean, I don't have family here. I'm the only one living It's here. just you? Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, talking about the nursing home, I was working as a dietary aide, and one of the cook actually got fired. Mm. They fired him on a Friday. And then the Saturday we went to work, there was no cook. The only re reason why I opted to cook was the, because I hated to do parts. What is the part? You washing the dishes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That was the only reason because once you become a cook, then you don't have to wash the pot. The only reason why I told my boss that, listen, I know how to cook. I just don't know how to do portion control. Right. So if you can teach me that, I would, I would, I would cook. The first day they tried me, the second day they tried me. I was actually filling in a cook position for a year and a half mm -hmm. before they actually hired me to become a cook. When I started cooking, yes. you know, every time they send the food up, mm -hmm. you know, at a point in time, the residents started talking, you know, oh. You mean talk as they were complaining? No, they were, you know, they were having word. Every time I cooked, there was something different. Oh, when you cook, it. okay, okay. So they want to know, okay, this day who cooked, you know what I mean? But I wasn't even paying attention. Yeah. Only, my only goal was not to wash the pots. Right. You know? And then summertime, we do barbecues. Mm -hmm. And when we do the barbecues and the family members come, right. even the sauces I used to do the barbecue, you know, they will bring containers. They want to take some home. And then I started thinking about it. Maybe I'm good at this, but the main reason why I'm sitting here today yes. as a big mo and I'm talking to you was the fact that this dark moment got so worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at a point in time, I knew that they were going to fire me. Yeah, it got it got worse. Like I would sleep, not show up at, at, work, at work, and not call, call in. You don't even call. No nah. call, no show. So I knew I was gonna get fired at yeah. a point in time.
So I was just asking myself, if I lose this job, yeah. what is my ultimate? Right. What's your next step? What are you going to yeah, do? What am I going to do? Yeah. You know what I mean? So then I started thinking, I'm like, okay, maybe I could do this food thing. So I literally started cooking in my house. And then, you know, at lunchtime, this same road that I have a restaurant on right now, all the barber shops here, I'll pack the food yeah. and I'll go into the barber shop just to showcase the food. Every day. You that were I giving pack, it to them for free. Some of them will pay know, for it. Yes. Pay yes. For it. So that if I do it this week and next week I come with it, I'm not looking to give it to you for, for free. free. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. I'm looking for you to pay me. That's right. And a lot of them responded well. You know, so I started thinking, you know, maybe I could do this, you know. So in 2018, somewhere around November, they were actually going to fire me at work. They were actually going to fire me. And, you know, the head of HR was yeah. like, you know, we know you're going through a difficult moment, yeah. so we don't want to do that. Okay, so they all, they all they saw no, they it. Saw it. They saw it. It was wow. that serious. It was that serious. I see. Yeah, so they were like, you know what, well, we don't want to fire you yeah. and ruin your resume, mm -hmm. so we would ask that you resign. Yeah. So I resigned from my job. I had some money saved and it was kind of crazy because mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, I was in and out of the hospital. Yeah. Like every other month. It was crazy. It was mm -hmm. a very dark moment of my life. So I had, I think, $30,000 in savings. That's good. I lost that money in two and a half months. On what? On the restaurant. Because you started, you started to build your own restaurant. Yes. I lost that money because I had an issue with a guy. Yeah. You know, he felt because he owns the place, he owns the business, mm -hmm. he was back and forth. And I had a, I had enough of it. You know, mm -hmm. I just, you know, stopped. And then I somebody invited me to do a barbecue for because I did a lot of barbecue for people. He invited me to do a barbecue for him in uh, Connecticut. So this guy came over there, you know, and he ate some of my food. Mm -hmm. And he came to me and he was like, listen, my brother-in-law has, you know, this warehouse in Hans Point. And, you know, we have this space in mm -hmm. the front. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want, you know, you can come and look at it. And they also sell cakey. They also sell shit all. Mm. So, you know, you can come and do your fish. That's right. And then, on the side. Know, on yeah. the side. So that's how Hans Point came about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. when I went to Han Hans Point, if somebody told you that that place was going to be a restaurant, you would never you believe it. You wouldn't believe it. No. Nah. How was it? That was an industrial area. I went on with it because I was trying to run away from what was going on in my yes. life. Yes. If I was cooking, I had peace. You know, so it was a way for me to engage in something That's else. That's right. And get your mind busy. And get my mind busy. Right. So I remember I bought a little grill. And that mm -hmm. grill is still there. Mm -hmm. I bought a little grill and an umbrella. Yeah. That's how Hans Point started. And, and why did you choose Osu R-E? Why, why did you choose Osu, by the way? So the initial name I gave Hans Point was Hans Point Grail. Okay. I was thinking about back home in Ghana. Like, if you go to Ghana, where would you go? And, you know, literally have fun and feel that you are really in Ghana mm -hmm. and have that vibe. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about Osu because Osu. when I was growing up, Osu was like Manhattan for us. Okay, okay. You know what I mean? Osu is... Literally where you have to be. Right. Even if you're growing up and you're a young guy, mm -hmm. you want to go out on a date. Right. That it's is where you go. Yes. It's also. Right. So I just thought about it and I was thinking about the restaurant and the concept and yeah. the, you know, the atmosphere I right. wanted to create. And I wanted to also give the customers of something to remind them of that's home. That's right. A touch of home. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, and I was just thinking about it and I said, no. I'm going to call Let this restaurant Osu. Osu Ari Grow. And what is the Ari? In Osu, they have a, an estate. It's called Riga Estate. Oh, yeah, so the, that, RE is the RE is Riga Estate. Yeah, Osu Riga Estate. Oh. Yes. A lot of people don't know that. I didn't know that when I named the restaurant Osu Ari. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you, if you didn't know, how did you come up with it? No, I had named the restaurant Osu Ari long before I actually called somebody in Ghana. To find out. To find out. <laughs> That is hilarious. Yeah. Wow. Running a restaurant in New York or um, the, uh, America as, as, as a whole is quite difficult. What are some of the challenges that you face as a, as a restaurant owner? It's, it's a lot because you have to remember food in America is regulated, mm -hmm. strictly regulated. Yes. 
and it's also capital intensive. That's right. If I tell you what it has cost me to have this place that mm -hmm. we're sitting right now, you'll not believe it. Mm. And it's an ongoing thing. And that is why a lot of the businesses don't survive. I think that we as Africans have not accepted the culinary industry as a profession. We still think it's a hobby. That also is a lot. Even me trying to project myself as a chef, right. it's difficult because people walk up to you, they come to you and you know, they feel like, you know, this is a hobby it's for a you, hobby, yeah. you know. They don't, they don't, they don't regard that nah, as nah, a nah, profession. Nah, you know, because back home, the food industry is, you know how to cook in your house. That's it. You put a table and chair in front of your house. That's it. You sell it. There's no regulation to That's it. That's true. You know, but true. it is regulated in America. That's strictly right. regulated, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that the difficulty is how do you project yourself to the point where you, you see this as a profession, right? as a business, mm -hmm. and not as a hobby. As a hobby, yes. Yes, I love to cook, but I cook to make money. That's right. So it's not about the hobby anymore. It's That's about right. the, it's business the business aspect of it. And one thing I've noticed, uh, this, this new location, one thing I saw, realized is that there was a Guinean restaurant that is literally a minute walk away from you, from this new location. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as, as a challenge? I used to work there. But now the, you the have your own this. is actually a friend of mine. We speak. She's the person that actually recommended this place to me. Oh, really? Yes. Because this restaurant we sit in us, right? Across us is a Jamaican restaurant. There are 13 Jamaican restaurants. 13 on this. Jamaican restaurants? 14. Okay. I mean, if you count this. Wow. It's 14 restaurants. I've counted between East Chester and Boston Road. Mm. They're coexisting. What is ahead of me and what I want to do for mm -hmm. our culture mm -hmm. and our food mm -hmm. and the way I want to project our food is too big for me to be thinking about some stuff. Great. The magnitude of pressure on me mm -hmm to literally deliver what I'm, I'm, I'm doing now, right now and make sure that every day is the same thing, is the same consistency. consistency. No. My customers are all youths. Right. This case, they're demanding. Mm -hmm. These are people who will take photo of every food you put on, in front the of table, them. Yes. They will rate the food, mm -hmm. they will comment, mm -hmm. they will give review. Right. So you can play around. You cannot. Tell me, tell me some of the food that you serve here. Our business is built on grilling. That okay. has been what I've been doing all this while. So okay. all our proteins, 90% of our proteins are all grilled. grilled. We do suya, mm -hmm. we do lamb, we do tilapia, mm -hmm. we do lamb shank. Mm -hmm. You know, we grill them, tilapia. We grill it just like you go to Ghana and you go and buy tilapia. Charcoal grilled. We don't do gas. Yeah. Everything is charcoal, charcoal. grilled. That's tough. It right? is tough. It's intensive. It it's is. a lot of labor. Yeah. And that is why, you know, barbecue food costs a lot. I've done this for eight years, you know, and it's a build up. I don't know if Joba told you. There was a point in time we, we were organizing um, Valentine's Day dinner. Yeah. Spend a lot of money. Yes. How many people will show up? Nobody. Yeah. Part of the reason why we are here today was that although we were doing good at Hans Point, but how many people are we able to reach? That's right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you don't have a car, it means that you can't access us. Mm. You know, what we're doing mm -hmm. is to certify people. That's right. So we want to be able to reach out to more people. So I think that this location, personally, mm -hmm. as much as I'm glad that we have it, I'm even more grateful that customers will be able to assess us yes so before we end this i would like you to put the address and you know um this is actually a new location guys this is yeah. a new location okay so the address is 1344 east gun hill road 1344 east gun hill road yeah the cross okay. street is either 16 okay or fish avenue mm. yeah big mo yes sir it's a pleasure having you here on our Thank show you, bro. folks that is chef mo owner of osu ari grill in the bronx and it's located on 1344 East Gang Hill Road. This is The Journey Show. My name is Nanadim Jr. Thanks for watching.